Dr. Dan Levy, Professor of uh, Pediatrics and the Director of the uh, Congenital Interventional Program. Uh, Dan, uh, you're going to give us your ephemeral wisdom? or <laughs> I'm going to give you my ephemeral wisdom, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Child. Um, oh, it was great to follow Dr. Lax with a standing ovation. Um, we, uh, um, but I, I think it's actually very fitting. Dr. Lax, you know, 17 years ago, uh, uh, one of his many great strengths, in addition to his ability to consistently outdress me, is um, his, um, his ability to see the future. And honestly, 17 years ago when I got to UCLA, he was putting in these really big valves and going, you know, oh, this is going to be great because you guys are going to be able to put valves in the cath lab. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, the word sapien hadn't even been invented, and melody was still like a nice song. Um, uh, but everything that he sort of saw in our field in the future really came true. So it's a really um, great privilege. And, and of course, uh, thanks so much to Jamil. This is one of Jamil's self-portraits that doesn't have him in sort of an armor-type medieval uniform conquering a <laughs> castle. Um, but really, the, uh, all credit goes to Pam and Evelyn and Cammie, and thanks so much for the real organizers of the meeting. But clearly, a lot of this is Jamil's uh, visions. Uh, I have a lot of disclosures, so much of which, a lot of what, what I say must be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but on to my topic. I mean, this used to be a pretty easy topic because um, valve replacement in congenital heart disease was all about the pulmonary position. but. Now it's, it's, it's gone to really every different valve position. So I'll try to give you, a, a, it's, a, it's a hard topic to do quickly, but I'll try to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're doing in every valve position and try to actually give some, um, some real um, basic tips and practical knowledge for those of you that maybe aren't actually using these devices. I always think it's great to be aware of them. This just sort of shows the overview of all the different procedures that we're doing now, and this is just at UCLA. Native pulmonary valves, tricuspid valve and valve and valve and ring, mitral valve and valve and valve and ring, and even um, uh, congenital aortic valve replacement in native aortic valves. So, uh, and this is, a, you know, in the surge, in the, um, this, this is just in addition to what we're doing with these valves in the surgical field. Really, the Melody valve start, started all this off, and um, uh, Jamil refers to this as the, still the AK 47 of, of, of valves because it's so versatile. You can put it through so much and it still works. That's the reference, not, you know, the, the, nothing beyond that. Um, but it's got these beautiful um, thin leaflets, and um, it, it, it's a 22 French system that feels like 12 French, honestly. And uh, this really has driven the field forward, and we've been able to do so many things with this valve. Of course, one of the things that the Melody valve has done is really been able to extend the life of the things the surgeons put in. Here's an RV to PA conduit, which so, so many of our patients have. Um, because we now have the Melody Valve and now CP stents, which are covered stents that allow us to really crack these conduits up big, uh, uh, to bigger diameters, we can now take a conduit like this in this adult patient and um, not only enlarge it, but put a, put a new valve on it and delay surgical intervention for hopefully decades, if not more. Um, the admin of the Melody Valve has really uh, allowed us to learn a lot of lessons, not only from others, from, from, uh, but from ourselves. We're very careful to uh, know where the coronaries are. We blow up balloons before we put the valves in to make sure that the uh, valves that we do put in won't do something like this, which is compress a coronary artery. We've also learned to be very careful about the position of the aorta. And, you know, I think one of the things that these transcatheter valves uh, do is they allow it the surgeons to put in, of course, to last a lot longer, and they've been really great for bioprosthetic valves. This is a slide showing the Melody valve inside a bioprosthetic valve. So now, you know, you put a bioprosthetic valve in a congenital heart disease patient, you don't have to say, hey, you know, maybe eight to 10 years. You say, well, yeah, eight to 10 years, and then you get a Melody valve inside, and then that'll be another eight to 10 years, and then you get another Melody valve inside. But of course, there's a limit to this because these bioprosthetic valves only get so big. Dr. Lax had the foresight a long, long time ago to only put in huge bioprosthetic valves, but that's really the tip. Um, what we need is, uh, if you're going to send your, your patients for a bioprosthetic valve, 
the bigger the better. We try to do 25 at, at the smallest, but typically bigger than 25 bioprosthetic valves. What we really need, of course, is a valve that grows. This is an example of a Melody valve being used as a conduit in a kid, so we can then dilate this thing up. And several companies are now working on bioprosthetic valves that will be dilatable. So this is a whole new world for us in terms of putting pulmonary valves into adult congenital patients and having these valves actually last decades and decades and decades. Um, this slide, I, I change it every time. I don't know what Melody Valve we're at. We're coming up on 200 Melody Valve implants uh, at UCLA, and that's just in about six and a half years. Um, the, uh, the only Achilles heel we've really seen of the Melody Valve frame fractures, but we know how to pre-stent and avoid those. But really, endocarditis uh, in the setting of a Melody Valve is greater than the, uh, than the surgical valve, so we have to be really careful with uh, patients, not only with Melody, but with Sapien valves. Any sort of transcatheter valves are uh, slightly more amenable to endocarditis, and if you, so you need to have much better surveillance of your patients. We have put them in all sorts of positions, and as you'll see, uh, we often use uh, other tricks to get these valves in. They're, they're still our go-to valve for any patient that's less than 25 millimeters in a lower pressure circulation. Um, of course, the problem is, you know, a lot of our patients don't have landing zones uh, that are less than 25 millimeters, especially all our TET repairs with transannular patches need much bigger valves for those um, landing zones. So this is really the kind of patient we want to treat, and this is the kind of patient that so many of us in adult congenital heart disease follow this patient with a massive RVOT. Um, three centimeters at least, um, and maybe more once you start stretching that. Um, so uh, one solution that didn't work, and uh, when we told Dr. Lax about this, he I said, oh, that's a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> the compliance, and he was right. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's great for Medtronic because you use two of their valves, but you know, uh, you can put them in the branch PAs. This has some physiological um, uh, uh, deficiencies. So of course, we'd rather put them in the orthotopic position, put the pulmonary valve where it belongs, and of course, we can do that, do this not only with Melody, but with our Sapien valves. And you know, at a lot of the adult congenital centers were way ahead with Sapien valves, not the XT. XT was what we started with. We don't like it so much. But really, the S3 valve um, is very nice for some of our patients. It has this skirt. And I'm going to use the pointer. Uh, uh, where's my good pointer? That, I like that big one. Here, there we go. It has this skirt here that um, allows to prevent perivalvar leaks. You can over dilate it. You can actually get this thing by adding more volume in the inflation up to 31 millimeters. Um, it's dilatable. You can actually crank it up bigger, which you couldn't do with the S3. So this has been a really great valve for the congenital patients. Um, we've done now over 38, but at the time of the slide, we've done 38 and 20, a nine hybrid pulmonics. And we pooled our data with some of the other senators, centers in which uh, there was a lot of adult congenital activity that contributed to these volumes. Um, and uh, we've really looked hard. The real challenge at this point with patients with, that have native RVOTs, and this is another tip, is it's really difficult to predict with uh, MRI scans and CT scans which patients are going to have, because you, know, you don't really know the compliance, which patients are going to have landing zones once you blow up balloons in them that are going to be uh, able, able to uh, support uh, transcatheter valves. And this is something that we're looking to Dr. Ranella, Dr. Finn, and Dr. Moriarty to help us out on, and, and, and we'll get there. But right now, this is still a challenge. We can tell you, hey, that's a terrible patient for this, but it's hard to rule in patients still. Um, this is the procedure that, um, that we do now. If the patient looks appropriate by cross-sectional imaging, we'll bring them to the lab, uh, balloon size them. If a compliant balloon has a waste on it, we go ahead with implant. And as you can see in this pretty small patient, we've got pretty big valves. Um, this is a Sapien S3. We have found some problems with these valves. This is an example of a valve that compressed the aorta. Uh, we're much better at avoiding this problem. And, uh, the sapien valve is uncovered, so it can uh, pose damage to the tricuspid valve. So although these things are great, they're going to get a lot better. Um, we feel like we're ahead of the curve, but you know, also when you're ahead of the curve, you, um, um, you're the first to find a lot of the problems. And um, all of the companies are working hard to develop new devices that, um, uh, that will get around a lot of the problems we see. The, the next slide I was going to show there is a, um, is a hybrid procedure, but I think that that's um, 
A lot of this is what's going to be covered by Jamil, but we have, are now working in concert with the surgeons to actually build landing zones and put our valves in. I think the next sort of um, uh, great thing that's coming down the road for these patients is, uh, is really focused on the native patients. And now, not only Medtronic, but Edwards also is coming out with, uh, with valves. We're the, we're the second center now to officially be able to implant this valve with, uh, in the new Harmony trial, which is the Harmony valve. It's a self-expanding valve that we will show you on the hands-on session tomorrow that will allow us with a self-expanding valve that probably won't have these problems with uh, aortic compression. It's an all-covered valve that's going to allow a lot of these patients with tetralogy of flow and large outflows to be able to get valve replacements. Um, this just sort of says that we're about to start this trial. The uh, uh, phase one trial has already been um, uh, performed and that was led by John Cheatham with some really exciting results. So I think this field is moving a million miles an hour and we're really hoping to be able to provide uh, even treatments for patients with very large RVOTs. Of course, there are other valves as well and um, the, the same valves that we use in the pulmonary position uh, work very well uh, here in a bioprosthetic valve, but also in, va in, in uh, valvuloplasty rings in the tricuspid position. This is a melody valve inside a very dysfunctional mosaic valve in the tricuspid position. Uh, very easy to implant. Uh, after implantation by ICE looks great. Uh, we've done a multi-center paper, not only looking at melody valves, but sapien valves in this position, and we're still following them to make sure it's an elegant solution long term. The other exciting technology we have now for congenital patients, off-label for congenital patients, is the Mitra clip. Um, these, this is a congen these are two congenital patients. These slides courtesy of uh, Marcy Calfon Press and um, Gabe Vorobioff, but these patients had horrible looking tricuspid valves, annuluses that are way too big for our current family of valves to be put in. And um, Marcy, Morris, and Jamil were able to go in with the um, mitra clip and grasp the leaflets together and actually eliminate the tricuspid valve regurgitation. This is a complicated procedure. Not all patients are going to be good candidates for it, but we've had some, uh, some, some results that really are just absolutely fantastic. Um, the same thing can be done in the mitral position. Um, both melodies and sapiens can be put in the mitral position. This slide that I got from Matt Gillespie shows all these different annuloplasty rings and what they look like with the melody valve in them, both from the um, uh, atrial view and from the ventricular view. And, you know, I think the real tip there is that uh, valvuloplasty rings for our stuff are always good. They're great landing zones, and we're actually working on devices to build things like valvuloplasty rings. As you can see here, this is a, a, a much smaller uh, gentleman who had a melody valve put in the mitral position inside a, a, a valvuloplasty ring. So, you know, a lot of times you may want to repair a valve. Okay, you know, sometimes if, if the repair doesn't work, as long as you have a ring there, it's a great landing zone for, uh, you know, this is a new computer. Um, <laughs> it's a great landing zone for, for transcatheter valves. What's that? Yeah, this is just, this is, I'm going to blame this on Steve Jobs, but, um, <laughs> um, it's so, you know, the other thing that these valves really quite honestly have given us is the ability to, um, use these, the valves that we typically put in in the cath lab as surgical prostheses. This is Dr. Lax actually cutting holes in the melody valve, and the idea here is that he'd surgically implant this, as he did in this patient, um, as an aortic valve that then could be dilated. Um, it was a great idea. Uh, according to this paper by Boston Children's Hospital, the melody valve works great in these high pressure circulations. In our hand, it's been a disaster, actually. Um, this patient, a couple of years later, had severe AR, and we just think that the melody valve isn't the right thing for high pressure circulations. So we now avoid it. So we've moved on to using the sapien valve as a surgical prosthesis. And this is another case that I think Dr. Lax did. Dr. Reamson's done these as well, in which the sapien valve was used as a dilatable. Um, uh, valve put in in the OR, and um, uh, the interesting finding that Dr. Lax sort of warned us about is he said, well, well, when we blew this thing up in there, the coronaries actually got changed their shape and get, can get a little compressed by stretching the valve annulus. So, you know, I think the take-home point here is that these um, 
putting valves in congenital heart disease patients is a lot different than what they're doing in the TAVR procedures, putting valves in patients with really calcific annuluses that don't dilate. Our patients in congenital heart disease oftentimes don't have this calcific aortic stenosis when they need valve replacements, and when we stretch their annulus with these valves, we're, we're going to potentially have problems with coronaries. So a lot of the work that we're doing as a team with the surgeons are leading to this, and again, this just shows uh, here a mitral valve in the, um, a melody valve in the mitral position. Um, this is sort of the, uh, my slide on transcatheter mitral valve replacement, but this is coming. And um, the, the devices we get from, this, from these efforts is, uh, is probably going to revolutionize not only mitral valve replacement, but tricuspid valve replacement. And, you know, this was sort of the, some of the early preclinical experience. This is from my buddy Matt Gillespie's paper. He was so, one of the first ones to build, a, build one of these nitinol frames that he could put in a uh, sheep and have it function as a mitral valve, but now there's just a million of these things. And every single big company is bringing one of these to market. It's a billion dollar market, and it's going to absolutely uh, change the way that we're able to um, treat the, not only the mitral valve, but the tricuspid valve um, in, our, uh, in our patients. And some of these devices are just amazing. And it's all really motivated by the billion dollar adult market. So, you know, in conclusion, I think you know, this all started with the Melody Valve, honestly, like, you know, seven years, six and a half years ago for us, and it's moving so fast. What we're we going to be able to do for valves in the congenital heart disease world, especially in the adult congenital heart disease world, because your patients are bigger and easier, easier is amazing. And I think really the key thing is, is working together. And, um, you, you know, not only as cardiologists with radiologists and nurses and techs and everything, but really with our surgeons. And, and what's really helped us is, uh, and this is Morris Salem here, who deserves a lot of the credit um, for all the work I've showed, but the ability to, for cardiologists to work uh, with really some real blurred lines uh, with our, uh, as a team with our surgeons is really what helps push this field together and, and make all this progress. Thank you very much.